Okay, everybody, I'm going to just start the presentation. Um, so, just a quick introduction. This, uh, <laughs> all right, so this talk is called Native Coin, Cryptocurrencies with Haskell. Uh, a little bit about me, so you know who I am. Uh, I've been programming in Haskell for two and a half years. I kind of discovered it my last year of university and kind of just got really into it. And uh, the first job I got out of college was using Haskell basically full time. And then uh, with Adjoint, this current company I work for, I've been using it full time as well. So I've been pretty lucky in that sense. Uh, so I work at Adjoint. I'll describe a little bit more about what we do in the next slide. Uh, I think cryptocurrencies are cool, they're really great. Uh, they have a lot of cool properties, there's a lot of cool cryptography involved in them. They are going to, I think, change the world in the next few years, but, you know, that's up for debate and speculation. Uh, I, another thing to make me human is I like to go bouldering, which is like indoor rock climbing. Yeah, <laughs> I do that in my free time. I don't have a ton of free time to do things active, and uh, this is one of the things I like to do. And then I love to listen to SoundCloud, uh, more like the mu music discovery process. And all this, uh, you know, kind of discovering art artists that aren't very well known. Uh, so, the company I work for is named Adjoint. We implement private distributed ledgers. So, we are asset agnostic, which means uh, there's not like a single token that you transact with on the network. It's actually, you can define any asset, and it can have some metadata attached to it, um, and you can transfer holdings of this asset and that, that type of thing. Uh, me and my boss like to describe this as the holy trinity, or not necessarily holy, but like a really ideal trinity to have in your day job. We work with cryptography, distributed systems, and programming languages theory. So uh, this is programming languages theory is because we develop smart contract platforms. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of smart contracts before. If you haven't, this is not the talk to learn about those. Um, just this is what's involved in my day job. We are hiring. Uh, you can talk to me after the presentation and email me at this address if you are curious about our job openings. We also have a website that's just adjoint.io as well. Um, so yeah, there's that. Um, so a little bit of background before I start. This is kind of like my first talk in a few years, so it will be a little rough. I put a lot of time into it, um, but that doesn't mean it's the ideal version. And um, there's with cryptocurrencies in general, there are is just so much information. So I'm really trying to present a broad overview of what it takes to build a cryptocurrency. And all of the examples of code that I give are going to be in Haskell because this is a Haskell meetup and I like Haskell and I wrote it in Haskell. So the general structure is going to be I'm going to introduce some concept and then I'm usually going to show how we do this in Haskell, either with GHCI or, or kind of the code straight from NanoCoin as well. So what is NanoCoin? Nanocoin is just a really minimal, currently worthless cryptocurrency that's implemented with Haskell and it uses all the basic ECDSA um, algorithms running and it runs on the local, uh, sorry, the multicast of the local network. Um, to really kind of unpack this, ECDSA is a, a set of algorithms in cryptography that allow for the digital signing and then verification of a piece of data such that uh, with a public and private key, I can prove that somebody signed something with a private key, and I can prove they signed that with their public key. But we'll get into all this later, I'll just unpack some of those words. And then multicast means that any nodes that join the network, they broadcast directly to all of the other nodes in the network. Uh, there's kind of a feature of, of modern routers that have this feature, and so like it's a one-to-many protocol. But we'll, again, we'll get to that later. So the motivation for this is that people love cryptocurrencies. Uh, they're really hot right now. Um, Haskell lets you write software that doesn't break. Uh, there's a lot of things I don't have to worry about when I'm using Haskell. Um, cryptography is cool. Blockchain is a slightly simple idea. I say slightly because, as we'll see later, it's not entirely intuitive. Um, distributed proto systems protocols should be simple. There's a lot of them out there that are currently really complex and it's really hard to reason about. But I give an example of a really good simple protocol. And then the last thing is that I'm trying to show that cryptocurrencies are not like super difficult to implement. Uh, they are difficult, and it's taken me quite a bit of time to implement it. But uh, I'm alone, and I've been working on weekends. You know, I, ha I have a day job, so I don't get to spend much time during the week. 
Um, these are a little bit less important, but these are the project goals. I want it to be well documented. I want it to not have a lot of dependencies. I want to give an example of classic proof of work consensus algorithms. Uh, I also, or a single consensus algorithm. Uh, it's a simple P2P protocol. Um, and then I want to demonstrate how we use elliptic curve cryptography to kind of get this guarantee of uh, the fact that you can't forge data in this network. All data that's submitted to the network is kind of signed and then verified cryptographically by all the nodes in the network. And then also there's a single transaction that's implemented called a transfer. Of one, transfer a nanocoin from one address to another address. Okay, so this begins the first section of the talk. Uh, the first section is on cryptography. The second section will be kind of outlining what a blockchain is uh, and how it's implemented in Haskell. And then um, the third section is how I kind of implemented this P2P distributed network uh, protocol. So first off, for cryptography, we have a few things that are involved in, uh, in cryptocurrency design and implementation. Uh, we have hashing, Merkle trees, finite fields, elliptic curves, public and private key pairs, and then kind of bringing that all together, we have the elliptic curve uh, digital signature algorithm. And this is a big part of uh, modern cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and uh, all of your other altcoins or whatever. They all, they most, all of them, I can say for sure, but they probably all implement some form of this, this algorithm. So a uh, hash function is simply a total function, which means it has an output defined for all inputs. Uh, and then it produces a fixed like output as well. Um, You'd like to think of these things as unique outputs, but unfortunately you have collisions, which means that some of the inputs, uh, they, the output of the hash function is equal. Um, luckily we use hash functions nowadays that, that prevent this, but uh, to be used safely in cryptography, they must have these three properties. These are really fancy ways of saying simple things. So basically it means uh, you wanna have a guarantee that if I hash one piece of data, that the result, uh, from the result, I cannot figure out what the data is that I hashed. Uh, and you also want collision resistance, which basically means, you know, if I take two pieces of data, they don't end up with the same output. Uh, this is very important, other, uh, because you can think of hash functions as digital fingerprints, as I mentioned here. Uh, one of the, the most popular hashing algorithms is called SHA-3256. Uh, the 256 refers to 256 bits of output, which means every piece of input you give to the function, it will spit out 256 bits as an output. Um, so this is a quick example of how you can do this using the Kryptonite library in Haskell. Um, you could probably run this. Uh, I, I've tried on my local environment, but it's not 100% guaranteed, but this is a good example. So um, we use the hash with function in, in Kryptonite, and you give it some piece of, uh, you give it some hash algorithm, in this case, SHA-3256, and then some input. And in this case, uh, the function wants a byte string, so we kind of coerce the string into a byte string, and then it gives us some output. And these outputs have letters in them because hashes are usually displayed in base 16. If we didn't do this, they'd be uh, basically double the size or, you know, like 1.6 times the size or whatever. Um, I want to quickly mention that if anybody has any questions that you think are quick and that I can answer kind of like, you know, pretty fast, then please uh, raise your hand and I'll get to you. But if you have kind of more of a discussion point, uh, please don't ask those questions because this is a lot of data, uh, I'm sorry, a lot of information to cover and I really don't want to keep you guys here for two hours. So, moving on. Uh, there is a key data structure called a Merkle tree. Um, I included this one under cryptography, be, uh, like I did hash functions, because they're really integral to a lot of cryptographic uh, primitives, but they're not necessarily, you know, whatever, you can decide whether it uh, belongs in this cryptography section or not. But either way, a Merkle tree is simply a binary tree of hashed data, uh, constructed from the leaves up. So instead of having, like, instead of starting with a root and then inserting a value and you know having these algorithms decide how you you know insert these uh, elements into a binary tree we actually just take a list of data as you can see down here this is this l1 l2 l3 l4 we first hash them into the hashes of this data and then uh, pairwise we hash the data together to get the parent bits. so in the end you're left with 
a single hash that kind of collectively represents the, the set of hashes that you started with, such that if any little piece of data in the beginning changed, then it will greatly influence this, this root hash. Uh, so in the, in the context of blockchains, these leaves are usually network transactions. Uh, another note is that sometimes the, the way I present some of these things are out of order uh, because they're, a lot of things are kind of like integral to each other. They kind of reflect um, each other and they're, they're used um, in each other's implementation. So likewise, when I refer to transactions, we'll, we'll discuss what a transaction is a little bit later. But kind of the key result of Merkle tree is a Merkle proof, which is um, a proof that we can construct uh, by looking at a, a full Merkle tree and then give back to the node that's querying for the proof. Um, let me rephrase this. Basically, an, every node in the network doesn't have to have the whole Merkle tree, the whole entire large hash tree. You can imagine that if this is not just four hashes, instead it's a, 10,000, you know, that's a lot of data to, to keep around. So instead, you can have something called a lightweight node to say, like, hey, I have this transaction hash, and I want to ask if it's in the certain block. So they send that data off to the, the heavy node, the node that is actually keeping all of these all of this data in memory, and that node will, will respond with a Merkle proof in which the lightweight node can verify um, using uh, these hashes whether or not the, the transaction actually is inside of this block. Um, we can, yeah. yeah, sorry, it proves the inclusion. It's another, a synonym is a inclusion proof. So it proves the inclusion of a bit of data inside of a block. All blocks contain a Merkle tree, and that's the representation of this like list of hashes, you know? But maybe I don't have like all this stuff in memory, and I just want to query for its existence. So I just actually, I, I hash the transaction and I, I have the index of the block I want and I send these two bits of data and then a node will construct the path um, that, so the node will construct a path, let's say I'm querying for L2. Uh, the heavy node will kind of collect the, all the hashes leading up to the root hash and then present that back to the lightweight node and then using um, I can just hash these items together in order to verify whether or not the block contains a Merkle proof. This is a very, um, this is not a very good explanation of what a Merkle proof is, but we have a lot of data to cover. And I just want you to get the idea that this is useful because we can prove uh, that subtract transactions are included in blocks without having to like maintain the entire blocks in memory. So just to go back one slide, this is a quick implementation of Merkle tree, these are just the data structures. These are not all of the, you know, the, the functions that we use to work with these data structures, but this is kind of how you might represent one in Haskell. There's nothing too interesting here. It's really just a binary tree. <laughs> and then uh, with special importance played on the leaf, such that there's a value contained in the leaf. And for each, uh, for each internal, for each interior, um, node, there is no data. So it's just a left and a right, and then there's some hash that the, the, ch the child nodes kind of make up. So there is data, but the data is a hash. It's not like um, representative of any other kind of piece of data in the network. We have open source this implementation. It's found in this website, so if later you're going back through the slides, uh, you can go there and look at it. Yeah. Sorry. No, sure. Right. Exactly. There's no really real way to forge this inclusion. So I'm asking you for inclusion, and then we're using hashes to kind of prove that actually, this actually definitely isn't, there's no way I can lie to you with this proof. Yeah. Okay, so. This is kind of the start of working our way up to ECDSA, the digital signature algorithm. Finite fields are... In short, this is a lot of like math, uh, you know, jargon, I guess you could say, even though there's no words. Um, but I'm going to explain it simply, and this is just going to be like how it's kind of you would talk about it in the paper or something. But basically, a finite field is a set of, a finite set of integers, of uh, positive integers, in which uh, addition, multiplication, division, and um, 
the, the subtraction is defined, but all of these operations are done with a modulus. So here I've just said that z is equal to like the set of the infinite set of integers, and we call something a finite field with uh, of order p, and then we represent it like this. But what that means is that like we just have the set of integers, and every operation, every mathematical operation is done modulus this value p. So for an example down here, we have the set, the finite field of seven, and those, that contains the numbers zero through six. Um, and then you can see some examples of addition here. One plus five equals six, so that doesn't go over. But if you do two plus six, that would equal seven, but you modulus the result by seven. And that is actually wrong. It should be two plus six equals zero. So. Um, no, no, that's not right. No, two plus six is one. You're right, you're right, it's right. Um, so, and then multiplication as well. Four times one is four. You don't kind of overflow the modulus, but then if you do three times four, that's 12, but 12 modulus seven is five. Um, this little G thing here, uh, this is called a generator point. So, something interesting in finite fields is that they often have generator points, which means if you take some number G and for all I, from zero to the finite field's order minus two, if you take the set produced by like g to the zero, g to the one, g to the two, g to the three, and in this case all the way g to the six, it will produce every element in this finite field. So in this example, the generator point is g, it's three, and if you take g to the zero, you know, you can kind of work this out on paper, but it actually, uh, g from zero to five, where g is raised to the ith power, generates uh, the set zero through six. Doesn't make any sense now, but we're getting, I'm kind of like introducing these small concepts and, yeah. Why is it P minus 2 not P minus 1? I don't know, because <laughs> math. Uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, right. So I don't mention this specifically, but usually the finite fields we're interested in are prime finite fields, which means this P is a prime value. It has to be prime? Yeah, sure. Right, so a lot of this stuff is incomplete for the sake of time, and I may explain it like not, not exactly, but that's because there is just so much information. You know, this is not a lecture about ECDSA. This is a lecture about NanoCoin. So I'm just trying to run through these cryptographic components kind of shortly and kind of giving you the idea of, of what they are without you really like fully understanding them, because that's not necessary. You just have to understand their use. So, um, so finally, we're getting to elliptic curve cryptography. So the general form of elliptic curve is this equation right here. Uh, you have x and y, and then you have some coefficients a and b. Uh, and so these parentheses shouldn't be here, but basically we say where x and y is in the finite field, uh, the prime finite field, which we write as e over fp, which means the elliptic curve over the finite field. So this means that the curve's domain is defined by all the x and y coordinates that are all modulus by this, this finite field P. This is going to get a little confusing. Um, this is elliptic curve. So this is an elliptic curve. It's not necessarily representative of the elliptic curve equation up there. There's a lot of different forms of this, but this is a good general way of explaining what an elliptic curve is. It looks similar to this shape. Um, Basically, all these equations under here are saying that for every, the leftmost one says that for every two points on the curve, there is a third point that intersects this curve somewhere. And this is how we actually define um, addition of two points. Well, that's not true. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But this is involved in how we define addition for these fields. Um, and there's also a few other rules, uh, that, which I must include. There's, a, there's an infinity point that kind of acts as the identity element of this group. Um, I didn't get discuss groups, but basically it's kind of like if you have addition, the identity element is zero. Because any, you add zero to anything in the world, and you always just get the thing started with. Um, so uh, furthermore, elliptic curves are finite fields defined by six tuple. Uh, sorry, an elliptic curve is over a finite field is defined by the six tuple, in which P refers to a really large prime. The A and B is referencing the A and B up here, their coefficients in this equation. There's some G, gen which is called a generator base point. Uh, this is referring kind of back to the same idea with finite fields, is that in elliptic curve cryptography over this finite field, there is some point in which you multiply 
by all of the numbers from zero to this prime number, minus two, and you get all of the points in the entire uh, elliptic curve over this prime finite field. The order and cofactor are not necessary for, for this discussion. But wait, they actually look like that. So I said that elliptic curves look like this, um, but this is when they're kind of infinite. over, over the, They're not over a finite field. When you have the elliptic curves over a finite field, it actually looks like that, because there's some bounded domain. In this case, you know, the finite field will be 257, if that's prime, so something similar to that. Um, and you can notice it's not total gibber gibberish. There is some symmetry over the x-axis, if you look closely. Uh, and this is a result of that. Um, so we're slowly approaching elliptic curve digital signature algorithms. Um, <laughs> so the main curve that most uh, or that some cryptocurrencies use is called SECP two five six K one. It is a Koblitz curve, which doesn't mean anything to you guys uh, or to me really for that matter. <laughs> um, and it's a special kind of curve where a equals zero. Um, in this, if you look back here, you have a to the a times x, you know, but here there's no middle intermediary x value because a is zero. And then b is seven. Um, the prime which the, of the finite field that it's over is this prime represented like that. It's a really huge number. Uh, this is so, there's a lot of points in, in the finite field. And then there's some generator point. Uh, this is displayed as hexadecimal uh, for the sake of brevity because otherwise it would be very long. Um, it wouldn't fit on the screen basically in one line. Um, so remember this generator point multiplying by some scalar, you know, repeated scalars from zero to p can generate all of the points in the entire curve. So one final thing before we hit ECDSA, and that's that idea of public-private key pairs. And hopefully this is going to be very easy to understand given the, the broad overview of the concepts I just gave. Uh, points in the elliptic curve over the finite field p can be multiplied by some scalar k. I mentioned this when talking about the generator point, that you can multiply points by, by a scalar and get, you get another point in the field. So I showed you that addition is defined and naturally you just derive multiplication from this addition. Uh, so a private key in elliptic curve cryptography, uh, and specifically ECDSA, is defined by some random scalar k in this finite field. So basically the finite field is over this very large prime and your private key is a random one of those. Just generate a random one. And from that you can derive a public key which is simply k times g. So I choose this random number in this finite field, and then I multiply the generator point by this value, and I get q. And q, or whatever p, whatever you want to say, it is my public key. This is important because there is something called the EC, yeah, sorry. Sorry, can you really explain how g was selected? Right, so I can't actually. I just know that people who do math for a living and who have PhDs think that this is a really good curve to do cryptography on. That's that's all I got. Um, this is like standard, like um, what's it called, uh, NIST. Yeah, they they like this. They endorse this curve. There's a few other curves that have equally arbitrary, weird names that you know doesn't don't mean anything to anybody. But for some reason, this is a great uh, field because it's really hard to find this thing which is called the elliptic curve discrete log problem. What this means is very simple. It just means for a given public key Q, you cannot recover K. So if I give you my public key, uh, you do not know the scalar that I multiplied G by in this elliptic curve over this finite field. Um, that's basically it. Right, so not necessarily raising g to the power. If you go back to finite fields, which is kind of far back, that was when, uh, like, that was dealing with just numbers, uh, finite fields. But now elliptic curves over finite fields are actually like coordinate, like sets of coordinates that uh, the maximum value of the x and the y are now <laughs> within this finite field. So when I say k times g, I, I really just mean like um, pointwise, not pointwise, but like multiplication of some, uh, you know, x and y coordinate point. I forget what they're called, ordinal? I don't know. So really, we're just multiplying the point by a value. Okay. So the key that has the key is the key? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So. 
And so it's really hard to recover case. So it's great, which means, uh, because it means this is how your private keys stay private. Nobody can recover this k value that you chose arbitrarily. Okay, so finally, elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, which is integral to uh, cryptocurrencies, or, or the current implementations at least. So it's a pair of algorithms used to sign and verify a piece of data. So to sign means you take this bit of data, let's say a byte string in Haskell, and you kind of give it as an input along with the private key to this algorithm that produces a pair of integers. Um, that's basically what it means. So when you say I sign a bit of data, basically I just give you an integer pair. And so to verify, well, I give you this integer pair and I give you the original data. So then to verify this, uh, this pair, I just, what that means is I take the public key that is corresponding to the private key that was used to sign, uh, as well as the pair and the message, and I put these three inputs in, and then I can say true or false whether or not this piece of data was signed by the private key. So the signing algorithm has two inputs. It's a string of bytes, a message, and then some private key D. I know I just used K in the previous slide, but that's because K is used in the algorithm. So now the private key is D, which is just some arbitrary scalar in the finite field, or the prime finite field, FP, which is that big prime that I mentioned before in the SECP 256K1 uh, curve. So yeah, I just, yeah, right, exactly. Um, so the algorithm is really simple. We just hash the, the document byte stream, which just means we take the message and we hash it, so that equals Z. Then we generate another ran a random value K, which is not our secret key, uh, sorry, our private key, our private key is D. Then we compute this, this other uh, X and Y pair from multiplying this new random uh, scalar by G. And then we, we compute some R value, where is X mod P, if R equals zero, then we go back to step one, we generate a new value. Um, Maybe step two, instead you already hashed it. Uh, but then for S, you just do this. Now I'm not going to read that. You can read that. Uh, D is kind of there. You know. uh, and if S is zero, you like step one. So basically, this R and, S, R and S pair can't contain a zero. And if they both, if this algorithm produces, uh, you know, a pair of integers that neither of them are zero, this is your signature. So to verify the signature, we need the the signature, the message, and the public key of the co distinctly corresponding to the private key D that was used in this signature algorithm. You can see D is used right there. It's the only part of the right there. So to verify this, we just kind of, I don't know if I want to walk through this like line by line, but you can see this is actually a super simple algorithm that relies on multiplying points in this elliptic curve over the finite field by scalar values producing results and then doing some other other um, you know operations that produce uh, and you verify basically that R in the end equals X mod B uh, given these. Um, so I can't explain the reasoning behind any of this. I'm just introducing you to this kind of like as a this is what they use. Uh, and I, I use a library called Kryptonite. I've mentioned before earlier when I was explaining the hash example. Kryptonite is like the cryptographic primitive sync in Haskell which basically means there's just a ton of cryptography stuff that's implemented and you can use it. And I'm going to give an example of how we sign and verify a bit of data uh, using Haskell. So these are all the imports. There's a lot of imports from um, the Kryptonite library. It's usually prefixed by crypto. Sorry. Yeah, Hasquez, and he lives in Cambridge, England, I think. Yeah, yeah. He's a friend of us. <laughs> That is a good question. It's because it is the most popular. It's the most widely downloaded. It's the most widely used. It has the most issues on GitHub. <laughs> it um, you know has the most stars on the GitHub project. And usually, this is the way cryptography works. You know, cryptography is an exact science in mathematics. But as soon as you introduce programming to it, you introduce all of the you know hardships of programming. So. There's no way of saying that these are exactly implemented correctly, but currently the consensus the consensus is that um, this is the best library to use in Haskell. You know, it's, yeah. Can you, is it consistent I am unaware of any, and, and honestly, it may be kept secret, or it would be maybe a private fork. You know, if someone wanted to, to kind of secure some highly uh, private data. Yeah. 
So <clears throat> the, 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 does the crypto correct or is it a cross check? Right. Yeah, well, well that it gets correct outputs. Yeah. Output. Right. Yeah. So to verify there's a there's a correct output is easy to verify, but right. uh, but uh, using uh, it is a different story too. Uh, there's a time of attacks. Yeah, that type of stuff. And and all throughout the, the code there's all these warnings, you know, like above a function that is um, there's something called a timing attack and a side channel attack and all these different attacks in crypto, and usually this is annotated on top of the the function that's saying, hey, warning, this is vulnerable to X attack, you know, use at your own discretion. Um, so anyway, getting back to the example, uh, we just have a quick message right here. Hello world, couldn't think of anything there, I don't know. Uh, you have this function get curve by name, which is in Kryptonite up here, you can see uh, the curve that I'm using is also defined in Kryptonite. I call generate on the curve that I, that I just constructed here. I get some random public and private key I then sign it with the private key using uh, the SHA-3256. What this means is basically before anything is signed, it's a hash first. So basically I'm just telling you to use the SHA-3256 before, before you sign it. And then I, you know, I feed it the message. And then I verify that this SIG output fed to this verify function here results uh, in true. And this is a good, great demonstration, quick, succinct. Uh, you know, I did in fact sign the hello world message with you know, this private because I showed this public key um, that I can. Yeah. So you're saying that every action is only articulated in code, not immune to it. So how does right. this handle that? So SHA-3256 is a hash function that's kind of like really well or strongly backed by NIST, which means um, you're basically like, it's, you're not going to have a collision. I mean, you can, like the number is so, the bits are so large, like 2 to the 256 is a huge number, just really, really huge. So the chances in you getting a collision are just so minimal. You know, I could probably come up with some crazy answer or like look up some crazy answer and say like, you know, more than the atoms of the universe or something, you know. There is just some ridiculous level uh, of certainty that we're not going to get a collision when we have sense. Okay, so this ends the cryptography section. Uh, how are we doing on time? Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so interesting. Uh, it turns out that with um, elliptic curves over prime finite fields, every single point is a generator point, which is crazy, I think. So multiplying any point in this field can give you all other elements, you know. There's just certain different levels of security involved. Like I showed you the generator point, the coordinates are uh, very large numbers, right? So obviously if your coordinate is one and one, that's not very secure. I don't know. Maybe it is as secure uh, theoretically, but like practically, one and one seems like it wouldn't be very secure. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Right, except for zero. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah, I could be reporting that incorrectly. Um, that's a very good chance. But uh, from what I read in several sources, this was the case. I was actually earlier trying to. There you go. Yeah. So actually, earlier I was trying to verify. I thought this was true for finite fields specifically. And then I was working some stuff out on paper. And I realized that, okay, actually, just for finite fields, not every point in the set is a, sorry, not every uh, member of the set is a generator. And then I dug deeper and deeper, and then I saw on some Princeton lecture notes, you know, that every, in a, in a finite field over, sorry, in, a, in an elliptic curve over a finite field, every point is a generator point. You know, that's, whether that's valid or not, I'm sorry, I'm just, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, I thought it was valid at the time. Maybe it confirmed my bias. You know, I was like searching so hard in finite fields for it to be valid, you know, and then I saw that, oh, it's elliptic curves over finite fields. So. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, so, but the main point of this whole previous section is not to get into the specifics. You know, this is not a cryptography talk. You should be specific when dealing with cryptography. That's not what I'm saying. You know, you really need to be careful. Disclaimer, like, 
Also, with NanoCoin, you know, none of this cryptography is like 100% verified. You know, I'm just using the most popular library. Uh, all of this is my, just my attempt to try to get you familiar with the concepts that kind of are used widely in cryptocurrency implementations. Wow, so it's been like 40 minutes, and we're only on the second section, a uh, third of the way through the slide. So I felt like I was going fast uh, already. Um, so like, I'm gonna try to speed it up a little bit and skip some things. Um, but if you're ever lost, please, again, for like really quick questions, I'm happy to answer. Just like if I skipped something or I wasn't doing a really great job of explaining. But you know, if you wanna like debate stuff, then let's discuss that after the talk. Um, yeah, and so this is getting more away from math, and now we're getting into you know actually the implementation of blockchain. So in some words, you know, there's a lot of ways to describe a blockchain, but one of the ways to describe that is a replicated state machine that maintains a cryptographically verifiable, immutable history of transactions, which I think sounds kind of cool. Uh, <laughs> maybe it doesn't mean much, but that's one way of discussing it. And this contains uh, a lot of different components. One of the components uh, which, of which are addresses, uh, transactions, blocks, and then some sort of distributed ledger. So I realized when I was going through this talk beforehand that I didn't really explain a ledger before I got into all these ideas of like addresses, transactions, and blocks. And what a ledger is is basically just a staple in memory representation of all of the transactions in the network that have ever happened. In this case, in NanoCoin, the only type of transaction you can issue is a transfer of some amount of NanoCoin to another address. You know, like I have some amount of NanoCoin, and I can transfer that amount and no more than that amount to some other address in the network. You know, and this ledger is just a map of addresses to balances. So it's just literally saying that, like, you know, X address has an X nano coin. And this is what we're maintaining along the way. And this is basically the foundation of, of nano coin, is this distributed ledger. So there's a few terms we need to define. Uh, an address is a unique base 58 encoded value that corresponds to some public key. Uh, you know, you just take the public key and you feed it through this algorithm and it encodes it and then so like this is a more succinct representation instead of two giant integers. Uh, remember a public key is a point on the elliptic curve so this is just a shorter way of talking about points. Uh, a ledger is a mapping of addresses to balances. All nano all nodes, all addresses in the nanocoin network start off with a thousand nanocoin and do not something. I guess I left that off. I don't know what they don't do but um, <laughs> they start, you start off with a thousand nanocoin uh, because I arbitrarily decided that. Um, if, a if an address does not exist in the ledger, it has a thousand nanocoin until it decides to transact or until it receives money. Uh, if it receives like 500 nanocoin, you know, it'll be inserted in the ledger with 1,500. If it spends 750, it'll be inserted in the ledger with 250. But the base starting point is if you don't exist in the ledger, you have a thousand nanocoin. This is done for simplicity's sake. This cryptocurrency is not meaning to replace anything. Uh, this is just basically an expose of all the different components that come into designing and implementing a cryptocurrency in a basic form. <laughs> uh, so a transaction is a data structure representing a single atomic modification to the ledger with a few extra fields that you know kind of help us with verification and that type of stuff. Um, in this case, the single atomic modification is a transfer of some nano coin to another address. A block is a list of these transactions that are kind of collected in one unit. Uh, again, with some extra data to, to validate whether the block is, is like signed and you know you can verify it by all nodes in the network. Um, and then finally, a blockchain said in a different way is a monotonically increasing chain, which means it never kind of rolls back. It always just kind of increases in length, in which subsequent blocks are verified based on the data of the preceding blocks in the chain. So every future block in the chain relies on some data in a previous block, such that if previous blocks in the chain are modified, the, the new block that's being generated will, will catch that and say like, hey, actually, like, you know, this block that you just told me is, like, that you're trying to get me to validate is invalid because of this, uh, this kind of collective history that we, we use hashes for this. And, I, and I'll get into this later, but I'm just trying to kind of give an overview of the terms right now. This is a long slide, too long of a slide for addresses. Um, we're going to continue. Uh, um, so again, we're just kind of condensing a public key into a, a shorter form. Basically, it's 64 bytes long because, um, because I said so. Uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of, some of these decisions are arbitrary again because like there's, a, there's no goal for NanoCoin. I'm not trying to, you know, like 
make thousands and hundreds of thousands of people transact in this network. I'm not trying to replace the currency. Some of these decisions are, are kind of arbitrary. Uh, it's base 58 encoded because Bitcoin does that. So, you know, why not do what Bitcoin does? Uh, and then this is what's used to identify other neural point users in the network. Corresponds to some public key. Uh, quick example in Haskell, you know, we take some public key and get the key points. There's a lot of more metadata. <coughs> Sorry. Quickly, the ECDSA prefix is from Kryptonite as well. So Kryptonite has an ECDSA module, and I use this for the digital signature algorithms. Um, and it has a lot of kind of values internally. As you can see, I'm requesting a field of that and then unpacking the, the point. So now I get the two in integers, and then we just have this quick drive address function that extracts the point, um, sticks the two x and y's together by converting, converting an integer to a byte string, and then I derive the hash of that byte string, which you can see I do here. I derive the hash of this byte string, which is an x and y concatenated, and I use the SHA-256 of the SHA-256 Ripe MD, I don't know how to say that, of the shop 56 of the bytes. And the reason I do that is because Bitcoin does it, again. I didn't decide this. They just think that this is a really great way to not have collisions, I, I guess. Um, there's a lot of work being done in this area, but they decided that it's this way, so I implemented it. And it's kind of quite simple, um, Haskell implementation. And between like this and that, that's your address. That's your address module. Um, in fact, this is not hash module, so your address module is even, even smaller. Moving on, we have transactions, which again represent atomic ledger state modifications. A transaction can be defined by the signature of the transaction header, and then the header kind of determines what, what action are we performing. In NanoCoin, we're performing a single action transfer, um, and that contains the public key that I'm issuing the transfer on behalf of. If I'm a node, I have a public key, I want to issue this transaction to the network. This public key corresponds to the encoded signature that I have attached. Um, to the transaction key. We also have the recipient address, who am I sending it to, and the amount, how much am I wanting to transfer to that person. Um, so, uh, this is, we can run low on time, so I'm just going to skip serialization. I'll talk about it very shortly. Uh, you need to be able to serialize these values, which basically means I need to take this Haskell in memory representation and I need to turn it into bytes. But then I also need a way to decode these bytes, because, you know, this is the way. Uh, computers talk over the network. So normally, I can just import data serialize. I can derive a generic instance of transaction, and then I can derive the serialization instance, just like that, if I build everything from scratch. But since I didn't, and I'm using um, this Kryptonite library, I have to manually write these uh, serialization instances, which we're not going to get into the specific stuff. But uh, Kryptonite gives us a lot of stuff, but it makes us write these type of things, because I have to tell Haskell, how to convert a public key into some binary string, you know? And also, how, how can I read that from the, how do I turn those bytes back into a public key? So. So you definitely need this notion of validation in a blockchain. So how do you validate that all these data structures are correct? Like, am I just accepting any of this data from any random person in the world? Uh, no, because you have the signature field, and they must provide a public key and, and sign this transaction header with the public key. What this means is that um, everybody in the world who has an ECDSA key pair can transact on the, on the NanoCoin network. Technically, everybody in the world has 1,000 NanoCoin. You just have to kind of issue a transaction and, or, or receive, be on the receiving end of a transaction, and then you have um, your coins. And you can use, uh, transfer them to whoever you want, as long as they, you know, are, are know about the network. So uh, there's a few. There's a really um, good way in Haskell to encode error types. You, know, you just have a sum type, like so. There can be an invalid transaction field, and it can either be an invalid signature or it can be an inv invalid transfer. And this transfer error type comes from ledger uh, because the ledger data type it kind of validates whether a transfer is correct or not. Um, and so. Um, so a quick note is when we're routing a transfer in the transaction, it often in a block, it often depends on the previous transactions on the block. For instance, we all start off with a thousand nanocoin. If I send the first transaction of a block is me sending 500 of my nanocoin to somebody else, and the next transaction is me sending 750 nanocoin to somebody else, remember I only start off with a thousand. So the second transaction should be invalid because I have sent first 500 
and then a 750. So that means I would have entirely spent 1,250 nano coin. But we need to accumulate the world state when validating these transactions such that the new ledger state we're validating each transaction on is reflective of the changes that previous transactions have uh, instantiated. If you're familiar with Haskell, this, can, this is a common fold operation. You know, we have some initial world state, and then we just apply the, each transaction, which takes a world state and a new transaction, and then returns a world state. So, yeah. Is that a scalability problem? Probably, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, there's transactions per second in Nanocoin, this is 0. 0.0001, you know, like, I'm the only one who's transacted on so far, you know? So like, yeah, probably you don't, you know, like applying all these transactions, you know, you could probably do it more efficiently and we'll, and we'll get to this. Uh, well, I'll pl talk about applying transactions as well um, later, but so I'm, we're still on validation. So in order to verify a signature, I was gonna get into more depth here, but you know, we're just only halfway through. So I'm just gonna skip this, but basically say like, this is all it takes. This is like, I don't know, a lot of spacing so that you guys can understand it better. But this is a Haskell function that takes some ledger state, some transaction, and it either says yes with the unit, it doesn't do anything, or it returns a, the, an invalid transaction error. Um, you can read it. We try to decode it. If it fails to decode, we respond, we return an invalid transaction signature. And then uh, if it did decode, then we try to verify it using the, the verify al algorithm from, from Kryptonite. If it, uh, unless it's valid, then return an error, which basically is, means like, if it's valid, don't return an error. So furthermore, to validate a transfer, we basically just attempt to transfer um, this from, so this public key of the issuer of the transaction corresponds to some address. We get that address with the derive address function. Then we try to transfer from one address to another address the amount specified with the state, with the ledger state. Uh, and if it fails, then we respond with an invalid transfer. If it succeeds, then we can just return the ledger. Uh, this is simplified. I'm using state T to accumulate errors along the way so that you know, I just don't fail immediately on one error. But uh, that's not relevant really here. So now blocks. Oh, man, there's so much stuff here. Um, <laughs> this is really kind of the simplest implementation I could, I could find. Uh, in, when I was, you know, writing the software, I really tried not to include, you know, too much irrelevant stuff, and I think I've included zero relevant stuff, but either way, we're making our way through. Um, a block has an index, a header, a set of transactions, and the ECDSA signature of the header. So this header right here is shown here. It has an origin, like the public key, just like the transaction. It has like a, man, that's further back. So transactions have a sender key. Block headers have a public key. Uh, sorry, an origin. Uh, you, I could have called, called it the same thing, sender key. It's basically the same thing. Uh, and that's to the key to which the signature corresponds. We have the previous hash, which is a key thing. I'm going to focus on basically only this for, for what a block is. So the previous hash is the hash of the previous block in the chain which also has a block header that contains the previous hash of the previous block in the chain, which, you know, going down the line has, contains a hash of the previous block all the way down to Genesis block. So basically it's saying, when I'm validating a new block, you know, I need to hash the previous block and include that in, in my block header. So then people further on later can validate this block by looking at their previous block and saying, hey, if I hash this block you gave, Sorry, if I look at the previous hash of this new block you gave me, and I look at and I hash the previous block I have, they match. If they don't match, your your block is invalid because you're obviously basing this block on different chain that I know of. Um, I've already gotten into Merkle roots earlier. I'm not going. I'm just going to explain that this Merkle root represents all these transactions here, and again, it has to do something with kind of like a heavy and light node. Some nodes can only store block headers, maybe. You know, if you don't want to store like the full transaction, you can just store references to this data, but that's beside the point right now. Um, yeah? Right, yeah, yeah. And yeah, and that Merkle, and that Merkle tree uh, right here, this Merkle root comes into play in the block header. So whenever we hash a, a block, you know, it's dependent on the transactions. Whenever, sorry, whenever we hash a block header, it's dependent on, the, on these transactions including them. So, yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. 
Uh, we need to be able to hash a block. This is the hash function I wrote. I don't think it's important anymore. Just know that this hashes the block header. Um, and there's not much to it. I made it a lot longer because uh, I don't like the list that just kind of keeps going over to the right. Okay, so this is kind of gonna, this is explaining a bit of what I've explained before. Um, so you, let's say you have block nine. Uh, you hash this entire block, uh, this system is the block header, and then I include this in the new block. And then in my block header, I also include this Merkle tree of all the transactions, which influences the next block in the ledger. So what this means is that if I change any of the transactions in previous blocks, if I want to go back and, and mutate history, you know, and then I try to mine a block or I try to generate a block on top of this new history I've altered, the, the hash that I provide you here in block 12 is not going to match uh, the hash that I come up with on my own of block 10 because you've altered the past, you know, and so that greatly influences the new hash that you're going to present to me and I'm going to invalidate that. I'm going to say the previous hash you told me of this new block, uh, of the previous hash is actually not representative of the hash of the block I currently have. So this is, um, I maybe you should have introduced this sooner, but this is like a big deal of like why blockchain history is immutable. It's because you can't, um, you know, you can't alter the history. I mean, you can alter your own history. Nobody cares about what you yourself say, but you know, as soon as you try to tell the rest of the network about that, uh, then they're going to say, no, you've altered the tree, it's invalid. So I'm not going to accept this new block that you've generated. <clears throat> and so uh, a quick note is that in classic proof of work consensus, which we'll get to in a little bit, there's this nonce field that you guys have been seeing and maybe wondering what it is. Um, I'm not going to explain it right now, but there is, there is a section where, you know, just know that it's relevant to, to constructing the block hash. You know, it influences the hash of the block. Uh, and we use this in the proof of work algorithm. So here are all the, the predicates that determine whether a block is valid or not in NanoCoin. There are more or less, depending on the cryptocurrency you're talking about. These are the ones I decided seemed good. Uh, could have had more, could have had less. Uh, but this is, I mean, it's not totally random, not totally arbitrary, but for, for the sake of the scope of my project, this was good enough. Basically it means, is the new block, so when I receive a block, I kind of run through these, these, um, these predicates and I, I basically say, if, and I ask if they're true or not, and if they are false, then I reject the new block. So I said, so I say, is the new block that you're giving me, uh, is its index equal to the previous block that I have, index plus one? You know, if I have block ten in my chain, that's the latest block. You know, are you giving me block eleven? If you're giving me block thirteen, you know, I don't have block uh, eleven, twelve, or eleven or twelve. So, you know, I'll reject that block. Uh, also, here's the kind of key thing that we talked about the previous slide. Um, if I hash my previous block, does it match? the hash that you provided in the new block you're giving me of the previous block. Uh, there's some proof of work predicate that I'll we'll get to later. Um, does the Merkle root of the block that you're giving me match um, the Merkle root of the transactions of the block you gave me? So if we go back to this header, you know, I say, is this Merkle root valid? Like, if I create a Merkle tree from these, this list of transactions myself, does it match the one that you supplied me? So then, um, are the, does your block contain any transactions? If it contains zero transactions, too bad. I mean, I, then I'm not going to accept your block. Uh, then I verify the signature, and then I run through, I validate all the transactions um, with, some, the, with the algorithm I described previously, how to validate transactions. This is implementation. This is the entire validate block function. Uh, I think this is great. You know, um, this must be like 20 lines of code to implement validation for, for block data structures. Um, I'm not going to go through it line by line, but basically it's a translation of this into Haskell code. And then each time one of these predicates doesn't hold, it does not equal, doesn't equal, doesn't equal, then we return less, which is like a way of specifying an error. Uh, otherwise, we don't return anything. Um, I kind of want to just like really quickly take a Haskell tangent and say that I really like this either uh, left uh, unit. So like you have some some type here that re represents errors, but then your, the right of the either type contains a unit, which basically it's isomorphic to nothing and just something, so where nothing is the right unit value and the just something is the error value. Um, but anyway, I don't know if you've ever used that in your code. Yeah, so like, at least one person knows what I'm talking about, and I like it. <laughs> so. Um, 
so finally, we get to the ledger, the culmination of what blocks and transactions and addresses all kind of add up to be. It's the it's the data type that rec reflects the culmination of all the blocks. So if I start off with the genesis block, you give me 100 blocks, and I walk through all those transactions in order, and every single one of them I apply to my ledger state uh, without any errors, I will arrive at the same ledger state that you have um, if you gave me the 100 blocks. So we know this because blockchains are ordered lists of blocks, blocks encapsulate ordered lists of transactions, and transactions are atomic safe ledger updates. Therefore, the ledger state is resulting from the sequential application of all these blocks. Um, this is our ledger data type. As you can see, a map of addresses to balances, uh, where balances is, is an integer. Um, yes, this could overflow. You know, I haven't, you know, you could have a million nodes all transfer a thousand nano points, or sorry, a billion nodes. I don't know, some arbitrary number you could overflow this. This is not secure. Don't use it uh, for your next ICO. This is my code. <laughs> Uh, we need a few operations on um, on the ledger. We need to be able to look up balances. We need, we need to be able to add balances, and we need to be able to add addresses. Um, when you add an address, it basically means like, okay, nobody, we don't see this address in our ledger, so I'm just going to quickly add them with a thousand nano points, and then I'll perform this transfer or whatever. And then we need this transfer that takes some ledger state. Um, a from and a to address, and how much you want to transfer, and it either succeeds or it returns a new ledger state uh, with the transaction being applied. Uh, we need to be able to apply a transaction to a ledger state. I've been throwing this word around, apply these, these two words, apply transaction. What does that mean? Well, again, it means to like actually take the data from the transaction, transaction, transfer, and then actually modify the ledger state. Um, and here is where I, I use the, the state monad. Um, yeah, it's, and then here's where we fold. You know, We just take um, a ledger and a list of transactions, and we apply the transaction, we apply all the transactions to the initial ledger state, accumulating the ledger state on the way, when we also accumulate errors. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if you don't know, um, the writer monad has a space leak, which means um, it appends things at the end of the list, and like it doesn't, um, I don't think I need to get into that. Writer monads are inefficient. If you replicate the same behavior with the state monad, it's more efficient. It uh, doesn't use as much memory, I should say. Um, and then the apply transaction code is here. Um, one of the things I wanted to do with all these examples is show you that this stuff is not like super difficult. You know, There's not a ton of code. Uh, bringing it all together, it is a lot of code when you talk about the serialization and all these kind of like arbitrary things, but the core logic that really does a lot of the meaningful stateful updates you know, and the validation and all this stuff it is, not, is not too crazy. It is very uh, tractable and within like the grasp of somebody like me over a few weekends. Um, as you can see with the apply transaction, we basically just verify that the signature is correct and then we attempt to transfer and then we, I think I've already uh, included this code as, ver as validate transaction previously, but now it's apply transaction where we accumulate errors along the way. Um, and then simply apply block is, you know, applying all the transactions of the ledger. Um, so yeah. Finally, the third, the third section of the talk. Oh great. Okay. So I made it through that section in twenty minutes. That's good. Um, third section is I think the shortest, which is great. Uh, we'll have time for discussion in a demo. I do have NanoCoin running, and we, I can spin up two nodes, and I can make transactions, and I can transfer coins uh, in my browser. Um, but we'll get through this last, last section, and then I will uh, yeah show you that demo. Yes. So that's going to be in this section. So I'll talk about the proof of work consensus finally. It's the very last thing. Um, perhaps I should have introduced it earlier, um, but I was organizing all, like trying to distill all this information into like a, a linear, you know, discussion is kind of hard. Um, but yeah, we will discuss that, and it will be very simple. And you'll be like, oh, that's like that's it. It's really it's really cool. Um, so. If you don't know what a distributed system is, it's just a network of computers that run all, they all run the same program, and they all, they send messages to each other uh, over the network. And there's some protocol, like what do these messages look like, uh, and how should I respond to these messages? There's a few things we need to, to talk about, and this is all I'm going to talk about here. There's uh, some node state. Each instance of the program has some state that needs to be updated. 
based on the messages. For instance, I have a ledger state. So the ledger is in this node state, and I need to update that ledger state based on the blocks that get broadcast. Uh, I need to develop a protocol that you know that lets nodes talk to each other. And then we need some version, some way to arrive at consensus. So like, why is this blockchain the right blockchain? You know, and why is just not any other verified uh, ECDSA verified chain of things uh, valid? You know, why why this one instead of other blocks? So quickly, I made a little textual representation of what a uh, distributed network looks like over multicast. Multicast again, I mentioned, is this kind of like one to many broadcast feature of modern routers. Um, so that's what is happening here. Um, all nodes broadcast to all our nodes si simultaneously. If I have a message to send, I can only send it to everybody. I cannot choose who to send it to. This is very limiting in our implementation of this distributed system, but is really great for an example um, and results in a quite simple protocol. So here are some things. Uh, this is how we define the node state, or this is how I define it in, in NanoCoin. It has some config, which is some network data. Um, some keys, the key pair, the public-private key pair used to issue transactions and, and mine blocks on. Uh, we have a sender uh, and receiver, which are basically just uh, functions from the multicast library that let me receive messages and let me send messages. Um, and then we have these three state. I separated them because they're the three stateful things that we need to change. Um, there's several ways to implement this. I like to use mvars uh, because they're quite simple in this scenario where you have a single process. I know that there's no, there's not multi-processes like interacting with this variable, and if I wanted to extend it, I could, um, because mvars are safe in some, you know, minor way of using. It. If you don't get too complex with them, they're quite safe for multi-processing. Um, yeah, so I guess I wrote that down here. There's some chance that multi multiple processes or threads may need to alter the same state. Okay. Because um, I have, I have um, sorry, I have plans to extend this in the future. If any of you guys are piqued. Um, I'm open to pull requests. I'm open to discussion. Uh, at the end, I have, I'm talking about all the ways we can improve this. Um, but anyway, getting back to it, uh, there's some mutable chain, the blockchain. There's a ledger, which is basically representative of a blockchain. It just kind of saves some computation time instead of having to analyze the chain every single time I want to talk about the ledger. I just also have this ledger, which is a succinct way of representing the chain. And then I have the mempool, which is something I haven't talked about yet. The mempool is the pool of transactions. Uh, when somebody wants to issue a transaction to the network, uh, it goes to every node in the network, and they all put it in their mempool. So that way, whenever a node goes to mine a block, it can take the list of transactions in its mempool, validate them, put them into a block, and then send them off to the network. Um, as mentioned earlier, ledger, ledger. Okay, this is the apply block function. This is saying like, okay, I've received a block on the network, um, so now I'm going to modify my node state based on this this block that I received. Take the node state as an argument. The previous block, because it's contingent, uh, depends. The validation of the current block depends on the previous block, and then the current block I'm validating. Just walking through this with English, I get the current ledger state. I validate and apply the block. If there's an error, report it. If there's not, I check to see if there's no invalid transactions. If there are no invalid transactions, I update my blockchain, and then I remove the block, the transactions that were included in that block from my mempool because I don't want to like you know. They're stale now. They've already been executed. And then um, modify the mempool, and then I update my ledger uh, on the resulting ledger state from the applying the block up here. So this is how we define a mempool. In, um, in NanoCoin, it uh, receives transaction messages. Um, and it's technically just a, it's just a list of transactions that will be used when running a block. As you can see, the implementation in here is quite inefficient. In Haskell, there's something called a D-list, which doesn't walk the entire list to append something every time. It kind of represents uh, a list as a series of function calls. Of, so like the thunk is really small instead of uh, just growing memory. If you notice earlier, I mentioned about the writer monad being space inefficient. This is why. <laughs> I've basically just re-implemented this inefficiency, but that you know that's something we can extend on in the future. Um, as I said, a mempool is just a list of transactions. Uh, and we need to be able to add transactions, and we need to be able to remove a list of transactions when we are updating the, the block state, uh, sorry, the, the blockchain here, or the, the node state. So transitioning to this messaging protocol. Um, so for, no, for nodes to talk to each other, they need a protocol. 
and which to agree upon things. You know, I need to be able to expect a certain type of message, and I need to then respond with another certain type of message. And we all need to be on the same page, or else the protocol will get stuck. Um, a key to good distributed network protocols is simplicity. I'm a firm believer of this, although sometimes you know that's off the table based on um, certain guarantees you want to have. But that's getting into distributed systems research. So. This is the protocol, basically, uh, uh, plus the, the, the algorithms to handle the messages. But the, the description of the protocol is basically three messages. I can either query a block. I can say, hey, what is block index 5? You know? and, or blo what block do you have for index 5? Give it to me, please. Uh, I can broadcast a block and say, hey, I have another block. I've mined a block. And then I have a transaction where I'm, I'm issuing a transaction and I say, hey, I have I have a transaction. Um, here's a transaction. Please add it to your mempool. A consequence of this, since it's a one-to-many multicast network, um, just the transaction, the, the network is flooded with messages all the time, <laughs> um, even with just three nodes. So uh, whenever, sorry, whenever like a transaction is issued or a block is mined or a query block is issued, it's just kind of like all the nodes kind of start talking all at the same time. So kind of the protocol description. Is, uh, for these three messages is basically like, what do I do when I get one of these messages? And I try to make it as simple as possible. Um, so when I receive, if I'm a node and I receive a, a query block message, I look at my current blockchain, one, and then I say like, hey, do I have a block of this index? If I do, then I send a block message. If I don't, then I don't. Then I don't respond, I don't do anything. Um, whenever I receive a block, whenever I receive a block message, I first query the last block that I have, like the, the, the topmost block. Let's say I have nine blocks in the chain. So I query for the ninth block. And I say, OK, can, and I query the ledger state. And I say, OK, can I apply this new block, given the previous block I have, to the ledger state? If applying that succeeds, then I ask for the next block. So let's say I got block five. I'm going to then like validate it and apply it to my ledger. And if it succeeded, then I ask the network for, OK, do you have a six block for me? You know? And this way, when a node joins the network, it says query block message one, uh, query block message index one, and then I get a block message back, and then I say, OK, two, and then I get another block message, and I say, OK, can you give me three? And this is how like, I update my, my ledger state that way. And then finally, there's a transaction message in which I send a transaction, and um, this is where I, uh, sorry, when I receive a transaction message, I just say, like, OK, I, I grab the current state of the ledger. And then I try, try to see if it's valid. And if it's valid, then I add it to the mempool. Otherwise, I do nothing. This is the protocol. This allows you know, blocks to, to interact with one another. Uh, sorry, nodes to interact with one another and uh, agree upon a blockchain, all except for the consensus algorithm. So this is the final few slides of the talk. Uh, perhaps some of the most interesting, which is why maybe I should have included it earlier. I don't know. But this is, this is really cool. At least I think so. So consensus is how nodes in the network agree upon the state, the ledger state, the blockchain. You know, We need a messaging protocol so that we can talk to each other. But how do we really agree that the blocks we're sending each other are valid? So you may uh, have remembered earlier I talked about some proof of work predicate when I was talking about valid validating blocks. Well, here's where I'm going to introduce what that means. Um, yeah, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, yeah, so in NanoCoin, classic proof of work, is used, and we just um, add a final predicate to block validation. And yeah, so these three slides talk about the proof of work, and this is all there is to it. The code I demonstrate here is all the code. This is like the entire proof of work algorithm. So we'll introduce it. Um, in classic proof of work, there's a notion of difficulty when it comes to mining a block, to, to creating a new block to, transact, to send to the network. I, there's a certain difficulty for that. Um, and this is where the proof of work comes from. You know, I need to work at some level to, to be able to, to create this new block. And for NanoCoin, the difficulty is simply decided by uh, we round the natural log of the index. So for instance, if I'm generating block 4, the natural log of 4 is 2. Um, that means if I round 2, it's 2, which means the difficulty is 2. Uh, so the difficulty determines how many zeros the hash of the block header must have um, as its prefix. Sorry, 
It determines how many zeros must be prefixed in the block hash. So whenever I hash a block, I need X amount, of, I need difficulty number of zeros uh, as the prefix, or else the rest of the network won't agree that this is a correct block. Um, just to kind of make this concrete, the algorithm is basically I create a block header and the nonce field is equal to zero. So I hash that block header and there's gonna be some random output um, based on the, the hashing algorithm. Uh, but if the resulting hash does have a prefix of this, however many zeros decided by the difficulty, then, I, then I've succeeded and I mine a block and I, and I send the block to the, to the network. Otherwise, I increase the nonce value by one and go back to step two. So the block had a nonce value of zero first, hash it, okay, it doesn't have the right number of zeros. So then I add a one, which is modifying the data in the block header, such that when I hash the block header again, there's going to be a new hash. So it's going to give me a new output, and then I can check to see if it has the prefix number of zeros, again, or the, the number of zeros is a prefix determined by the difficulty, right? So chances are that hash is not going to have that many zeros either, right? So then I increase the nonce to three, or four, or five. Um, I keep doing that until I have the right number of zeros in the prefix of the hash, and then the rest of the nodes in the network will will say, okay, you know, when I hash your block header, I do get this many zeros, so therefore, you know, your block is valid. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right, exactly. So one thing to note is that difficulty is this protocol independent. You know, Bitcoin has a certain way of determining difficulty. Ethereum networks have another way of determining difficulty. This is for simplicity, you know. Uh, actually, there's a flaw uh, or um, a feature in this, this proof of work algorithm that is said here. I'm just gonna read it verbatim. Uh, one of the most notable results of the proof of work is that it's hard to generate a block, but easy to verify the work. So for this implementation, the average nonce, the average number that I'm just ran, this number that I'm adding to the block header to get new hashes, computed is 16 to the n, where n is the index. So if I'm trying to generate the first block, I will, on average, have to only, the nonce will be 16. I'll only have to increment the nonce 16 times. But if I'm trying to, trying to generate the second block, well now all of a sudden the average nonce that I generate in order to get several hash, uh, the prefix of zeros in, in the beginning of the hash is 16 squared, which is 256, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, in turn, if it's the third block, you know, it's 16 cubed, which I don't know the answer. So basically what this means is that when the length of the chain surpasses 12, this difficulty output, this algorithm, makes it take like actually several seconds. When I, when I tell a node to mine a block, it will like hang for a few seconds while it's rapidly just going from 0 to 16 to the uh, 12th, you know, uh, generating these, these numbers so that it's hoping to have that many uh, number of zeros. And as n surpasses 23, as we are starting to mine the 23rd block, on average it'll take about 10 minutes to increment this, and just, you know, just keep incrementing the nonce until it finds uh, a hash that has that many, a certain number of zeros. So if n is 23, log, natural log of 23 is something like, I don't know, five or six or something. Um, so that means it has to have six zeros, and the chances of of finding six zeros in a hashing algorithm that is base 16, is basically like 16 times each position that I want. So if I want six zeros, it's basically like um, one in 16, one in 16, one in 16, one in 16. Uh, so one in 16, six times. Um, and that means it's that's a very large number. Uh, so <laughs> so it takes a really long time to, to find this hash. And, no, so the difficulty would be 23. Um, which means that the, the natural log of 23 is, is four, 5 or 6, which means you need 5 or 6 zeros to prefix. But each, each uh, digit, digit in the hash is, is represented by 16. So there's 16 different things that could be, but we want zero. So basically, like, we want 1 out of 16 uh, for, the, for each position. So if we want 5 or 6 zeros, there's a 1 in 16 chance of generating a zero for each position. And if, in probability, you kind of like put those together, you get 16 to the, um, to the fifth. No. You're right, actually. I think you just caught that. Right. It's like, so instead of n here, it's actually um, 
the result of the difficulty. So 16 to the, the difficulty, the power of the difficulty. Yeah. Um, so maybe instead of 23, it's like block 40 or something. But 16 to the fifth is still pretty large, I think. Um, so anyway, just the, the final thing I want to mention um, is that this is the entire implementation of that. This and that. So this is the algorithm. I start off with the, the nonce of zero. Um, this top nonce function takes some value. It checks to see. It calculates the prefix based on the difficulty of the hat. And then it checks to see if the prefix equals the number of zeros. Or the prefix is just like, all right, repeat the number of zeros. Repeat zeros a certain number of times with the difficulty. And then um, hash the block and see if the prefix can equal each other. Um, so this is the thing that's going to loop really fast forever. And then to check it is really simple. This is one of the key results. Proof of work is hard to generate a block, to generate this hash, but it's really easy to verify. In this check proof of work, all we do is say like, hey, how many zeros do we need? Okay, make that many number of zeros. All right, is that many number of zeros a prefix of the hash? And it's super fast. And this way, all the nodes in the network can validate the, the block really quickly, but in order to generate a valid block, it takes some time. See that question? Yeah, there's no, it, it could happen that you got six zeros on zero, like on non zero, you know, just out of luck, you've generated this. And, right, that is, yeah, that's equally valid point. Technically, it's a random, it's, it's random, pseudo random, based on the hashing algorithm. And um, yeah, you could just generate arbitrary size nonces. But the thing is, is like, well, what's the bound on what you generate, you know, and then, then you have to generate a number of zeros through. Yeah, right, exactly. So, um, yeah, it, it, but it doesn't matter. You don't have to just increment it one by one. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, so I, I lied. This is, this is the last um, slide. I'm not going to skip the other part. Um, okay, so you've probably heard of a chain fork. Uh, I don't know if you know about Bitcoin, but recently Bitcoin has had a fork. Uh, now there's Bitcoin Cash. Um, I just want to describe what that means. It just means a certain subset of nodes have agreed on a different uh, protocol. Actually, forks happen a lot, even when they all agree upon the same protocol. Um, the, the thing is, though, there's a way of res resolving this fork, and it happens all the time in the Bitcoin network. So what happens is that because of network latency, let's say I broadcast a transaction, and this transaction gets to a certain subset of nodes before it gets to like the entire network. But then somewhere else in the network, somebody else, uh, let's talk about blocks. I've just mined a block. And I broadcast that to everybody around me. But then somebody else, at the exact same time, has mined a block as well and broadcast it to everybody they know. And slowly this block is like propagating its way through the network. And at some point, like all of these nodes have adopted this other block that this miner over here has generated. And then all of these nodes over here have adopted the, the block that these, this have generated. And so at some point they're going to interact and say like, hey, you have the same size blockchain as I do. Like which blockchain is correct? So naively, this can be resolved with chain height. You know, what that means is that the the index of the current block being presented, or, or how big the chain is, depends on which one wins. If I'm a miner and I'm just like mining my hardest, and I mine three blocks, but someone comes to me and presents a chain that's like four blocks, like one block more than I've mined, and everybody else has already agreed upon it. Oh well, throw out the three blocks that I just mined because actually there's a majority of the network that agree, agrees on a different chain than me. And this is just a result of network latency. Um, so it's really good to have a lot of hardware when you're, when you're doing this proof of work so you can generate blocks quickly, but it's also really good to have fast internet connections and be connected to a ton of nodes so that you can kind of present your block as truth to the entire network as fast as possible so that your blocks that you mine are, the being, are blocks being mined on the long, longest chain. Does this lead to issues Yes. Um, yeah, that's. I would say so. Um, but it's probably something we should discuss later. But I mean, my immediate answer is yeah. So it's just really kind of a, and as well as the number of transactions in the block and all, all these type of parameters, they're just kind of, you know, parameters of the protocol, and you modify these based on what you need. Some networks don't need high throughput. Um, so currently, NanoPoint doesn't resolve for it, but this is a really, really easy modification to the protocol that. 
you know, I'm open to pull requests if you guys want to try to implement this. Uh, basically, just chain scoring based on chain height, so that if like nodes mine blocks, um, you know, there's two different competing chains, you just kind of decide on what the best chain is based on the height of the chain. Right. So if they're the same height, then you kind of you have some other way. You have like a secondary resolution, and in Bitcoin, I think it's called hashing power which has to do with like how hard did the miners work and there's some way of like resolving this you know like okay if there are two equal chains like did one miner actually spend longer on the work you know and and this is determined by certain or they worked harder at some metric you know you can gauge and there's a way of of um, deciding that yeah Well, yes, but then you're kind of, um, if you didn't have the secondary resolution, then you'd be forking the network permanently. So like then all of a sudden this network over here will start mining only on these blocks and like the history will be different than the, this other network that's decided. So you want to keep the history the same, which is why you have kind of these backup ways of, of resolving these forks. In, in the, the case of the Bitcoin cash fork, it was actually a different fork. It's a protocol fork, which means they actually designed different rules uh, for what makes blocks valid and that type of thing. So that now the histories have diverged permanently. They want to make sure that actually we don't want to interact with this other chain. We want to change the way the nodes interact. And then there's a separate network now that, that transacts with those. Okay, so this is a, this is a, that's a, basically the conclusion of my talk, but I'm just going to quickly run through the way you use Nanocoin. Um, if you want to install it, uh, I use Stack as the, the kind of de facto Haskell build tool. Uh, this is all it takes. You just run, you kind of clone the project, install Stack, uh, and then do Stack setup, Stack install, whatever. Um, it defaults to port 3000, so you can just run Nanocoin itself. This is what this is here. You just run Nanocoin, defaults RPC port 3000, multicast port 8001. You can uh, use some existing set of key pair, uh, but otherwise it'll generate not existing set of key pair, but you can existing key pair that you have uh, that's serialized the way Nanocoin likes it to be serialized, or it'll just generate a random key pair for you to start interacting with the network. You can see here the options. So basically the RPC interface is just a way to interact with running nodes. Uh, I don't have a command line interface, which is horrible. Uh, this is a really great thing to do next uh, if you want to you know, help out, uh, is build up this command line interface so you can interact and you don't have to interact with the node in this really annoying browser like uh, HTTP request method. Uh, I didn't have time to kind of revamp this. So you can query about the node state and you can tell the node to do something. Uh, for the queries, you can ask the node what its address is, you can ask what the blocks, what its blockchain is, uh, what transactions are in the mempool, and then, so what is the state of the ledger? Instead of having to like look at the blocks and just like construct the ledger in your head, you can just, this is kind of like the state that represents all the blocks in the network. And then there's two things to, to tell. Uh, two things you can tell a block uh, node to do, and one of them is to mine a block, uh, given the current transactions in its mempool, so you might want to check its mempool first to make sure there are transactions, otherwise it won't mine a block. And then you can transfer. Uh, this transfer uses the implicit um, public key of the node, so you don't have to specify the from, it's just the node that you're executing it on, and you specify what address to go to, and how much in a coin that you want to transact. Um, if you transfer more nanocoin than you have, the transaction will be rejected. So don't do that. Um, yeah, so my key points is uh, cryptography is cool. Um, as an engineer, I don't have to be a mathematician, but I do have to respect mathematicians, and I need to interact with them. And I need to make sure that cryptography is used correctly. But it's still cool, um, naively. <laughs> so Haskell is really great. I mean, I just wanted to say that. Uh, we're all at a Haskell meetup, so... I think it's, um, so yeah, also cryptocurrencies are complex pieces of software made of simple components. All the things I've illustrated here may not seem simple. Uh, if you spend enough time thinking about them, they kind of are simple compared to like the entire culmination of them all into this big complex thing. Um, and then finally, if any of you were piqued uh, of interest and you want to work on kind of like a project cryptocurrency that has so far to go in, you know, being... You know, there's just so many ways it can be improved. Uh, I don't know if I've said this, but I want to iterate that, uh, reiterate that I didn't build Nanocoin to like replace any existing cryptocurrency. I didn't build it for you know for it to be viable or to, for it to be used. I kind of built it to illustrate all of these points, 
And um, that was the whole purpose behind it. So for the future work, implement a command line interface so that instead of using the browser, which you'll see in a second, is super annoying. Um, there's no testing module, <laughs> which is really bad. Um, I just didn't have the time on the weekends for the TDM of writing these tests. Uh, but you know, it might be if you've never written a test suite before, I can definitely direct you in the way of doing that, or, or like suggesting some methods, and it would be a great example. Uh, persistence using a database. Currently, everything's in memory. If you kill a node, you've killed its entire history. And when it rejoins the network, it'll have to build it all back up again. So this would be another nice thing to work on. The cloud Haskell, multicast the cloud Haskell. Uh, so what that means is uh, Cloud Haskell is a distributed processing library that's really good at uh, having processes running on separate computers in a distributed network to talk to each other um, and send messages back and forth. And they implement a lot of, like, it's just basically a framework, a distributed processing framework. And I want to transition away from this one-to-many uh, model to one-to-one. -to -one. So traditional, um, traditional distributed system protocols, or at least some of the ones in use today, are kind of one-to-one. -one. You know, I can target a node directly. The current what? Okay, um, shy, just shy of two thousand. But there's a lot of kind of annoying code that I had, like serialization and JSON instances and stuff, um, that I had to, to to implement because of Kryptonite. I'm using all of those data types, and I, mean, I could just do orphan instances for all of them, but a lot of them are nested data structures. So I, if I do an orphan instance of one, I basically have to do like an orphan instance of the six data types that make up. And you know, that's fine for a pet project, but I just didn't do that for some reason. So there are some orphan instances, but minimal. Um, and then, so that's the end. Um, I will do a demonstration, but that's just the end of the project, I guess. Thank you. Um, so quickly, I do wanna give a demo. This is a really interesting part. This is like where it all works. Uh, all the stuff you saw, you know, it's gonna gonna come to life. So as you can see, I'm in the NanoCoin directory. That's super tiny. You don't need to see that. I'm gonna use the browser. So I'm just gonna run the NanoCoin uh, program. I'm booting up two nodes right now. So one of them is defaulted to port 3000. As you can see, the Scotty Scotty web server. The other is port 3001. But this is where we are actually interacting with them, and just. I'm going to try to display this nicely. I don't know why I can't, why it won't connect to, um, does anybody know why it's not snapping? It's not very nice. Like snapping to the, okay, do this thing? Oh. So, yeah, that's it. Like, I don't normally use GNOME. I normally use Xmonad, but it wouldn't let me present with, like, a shared screen. So, like, now I'm lost. So, click the maximum button. Okay. So, where is that? The here. Okay. Oh, okay. Nice. Wonderful. Okay, how do I open a new one now? I can just take localhost. So we're going to do localhost 3000 blocks as the genesis block, and then we're going to do localhost 3001 blocks, and then I'm going to take this and put it over there. All right, great. This is cool. So th these are two nodes running. There's a genesis block. Uh, it's signed by a genesis key. The genesis key is in the repo. It's just a publicly available key. None of the nodes are going to transact with this private public key pair, but this is how we instantiate what is the first block in the network. As you can see, the index is zero, and it has zero transactions. So what we're going to do is both of these nodes have addresses, and we can query this address like that. We have different addresses, naturally. Um, we're going to take this address of this node, and we're going to tell this node to transfer some money to it. We're going to say, hey, uh, transfer 500. But before we do that, I want to show you that the ledger is empty. There are no transactions. There's nothing that have been done. The mempool is also empty. But as soon as I issue this transaction, 
um, it returns the transaction. So as you can see, there's a signature, then there's a transaction header, and I'm transferring 500. Uh, the sender key is encoded as the, the points, X and Y points, but technically it's just the public key. And then the recipient is the address that I entered in up here. Uh, you can see this, this node over here. If we look at its mempool, it actually has the transaction in the mempool. Uh, so what's, we're going to go ahead and try to mine a block. So we did that and we said, whoa, that's, that was fast. And the nonce is zero. Why is the nonce zero? Well, it turns out the natural log of one is zero. So it needs zero zeros to prefix the hash by. So it can take just whatever hash spits out. As you can see um, right here, the previous hash as n to, maybe it's a, is that too small for you guys? Um, control. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah, sorry. Um, so that's that's one block, and now you can come over to this other block, this other guy, and say like, all right, what are your blocks? And you can see that there's this n there's a new block here as index one with non zero, and it matches the block that this guy mined exactly. Um, this guy's blocks they're they're both the same, um, which is great. So now let's try to transfer. Um, one more time, let's try to transfer a little bit more than we said. Transfer. Uh, sorry, a little bit more than is allowed. Um, then let's try to transfer 750. So this guy's already transferred 500 to this guy. So now we're going to transfer 750. And the transaction creation succeeds. And I think it will even propagate to the mempool. But... When you go to mine a yeah, so the this transaction's in both of their mempools now. But when you go to mine a block, it's gonna look at the state of the ledger. And then it's gonna say, hey, there's no transaction to be mined, because it's gonna go through the transaction, it's gonna see that one invalid, and it's gonna discard it. So it should be mine block. And then um, I'm sure there's just an error there. Um, so it really should display an error, but yeah, I don't know. Let's just say that it erred um, <laughs> for the sake of... For, but uh, if you look, the mempool here should be empty. Yeah, so it just discarded the transaction when it was trying to mine the block. It said it's invalid, it's stale, you know, uh, don't do anything. So if we look back to the blocks, there's still only one block uh, in the Genesis block. Um, and then just quickly, I want to do um, one more transfer back so that they have... They all have... Um, the, the final thing I want to show you is that, uh, just sorry, uh, adding a new node to the network. So we're going to trans 500, transfer 500 back, and then we'll make this guy mine the block. And then he mined a block, and then if we look at blocks. Now we have this block index 2. You see the nonce is 1, and wow, we got a 0 right, right on the, the first hash that we created, which is great. Um, and so now if we look at the ledger, we can see that they both have a thousand again. So um, I'm going to transfer one more time. Uh, recipient, a I don't know. Is that enough? Let's just join the network. Let's just have another guy join the network. Um, say uh, nano coin, and then nano coin p three thousand two. Boom. And then you can see this protocol kind of in action where they're just like spamming everybody. But then uh, if we open up this local host 3002, it should display all of the blocks. And you could say, okay, why is this so great? Um, and the reason it's so great is because nobody can forge transactions. Uh, using the cryptographic material uh, that, I, that I presented, um, there is no forgery here. So... Technically, you just have a map of addresses to balances, and you're transferring some a bit of you know that balance to another address's balance. That's simple. You know, you can do that in 15 lines of code. But to turn it into like a distributed system, and you know this kind of distributed ledger where block uh, where nodes can transact crypto cryptographically securely, um, that takes the rest of the 1,800 lines of code or so. Uh, so <laughs> that's the result. Um, Currently, nanocoins are worthless, but you know, like, people are spending millions and hundreds of millions of dollars funding projects 
literally vary like this. Some of these projects that are raising hundreds of millions of dollars do only, they only have a white paper. They don't even have a public test net. They don't even have completed software. You know, they're banking on this idea. And uh, I just wanted to illustrate how personally I can implement something very similar to something that's raising, yeah, you know, I could spend you know, 50 more hours writing a white paper about all these ideas and make it seem super flashy, right? But this software that I'm presenting you is akin to like some of these private blockchains that are in, de in development now. So um, that's that. This is the demo. Yeah? That was a pretty opinionated what statement. Yeah. Not many, but um, there are certain there are certain things you can choose. There are certain things you can choose to alter. Like uh, let's say just the consensus mechanism instead of proof of work, you know, maybe I invent some super cool proof of authority mechanism and then I implement that and I market this this consensus algorithm, you know, but everything's the same. But like oh now it's more secure because my proof of authority algorithm doesn't let you know X Y or Z attack happen, you know, and oh my transactions per second is ten thousand now, you know, Bitcoin's is only ten. You know, and there's all of these different ways you can modify this software to accomplish different goals. Um, and they all, they don't differ very greatly, or some of them do. There's some good, there's some good stuff being done out there. Uh, but, so I mentioned earlier that my difficulty algorithm is selected to prevent this. Like I kind of like gave it a cap. I spent like 30 minutes thinking about it three months ago or four months ago. It just takes forever. Like the, there's no cap. Nothing. Yeah, right, no, currently nothing. But oh, I didn't mention that on the future work. This is a, a nice thing I would like to extend it, a block reward. So if you mine a block, there's some nano coin that is a special transaction uh, that's included on in your mind block that transfers you out of thin air a certain amount of money. Um, and there's some rules to this, you know, like every, in Bitcoin things like every 2016 blocks or something, something arbitrary like that, uh, the number of Bitcoin you win to mine a block is, is halved. And this is what creates the cap on the number of Bitcoin. This is why there's a finite number of Bitcoin in the world. Actually, there's, there's only the amount of Bitcoin in the world that exists right now, but there's a, certain rules that dictate how much will exist in the future. Um, and this would be a really fun thing to implement on, for NanoCoin, you know, this kind of reward transaction. Uh, then instead of transfers being the only transaction that could be issued on the network, there would be the special transaction that, you know, block miners kind of slid in there right at the end. Um, I think you have your hand. The consensus algorithm, even if the only criteria is the it seems like a very successful So the Bitcoin protocol is at a really high difficulty right now. Um, so it does take quite a lot of hashing power to mine. Sorry, basically just resource, like hardware, to mine these blocks. Because I, I think it's something, I really don't know the number of, of zeros in the front of it. This is actually Bitcoin's proof of work, or part of it is the number of zeros in the block hash. But it's something like, you know, between 10 and 30 or something, you know. And then if it's a base 16 hash, you know, that's 16 to the 30th power. So, you know, the chances of you finding this this nonce that gives you the right hash takes just a ton of com computational power. And it's not smart computation, it's just brute force. Like, how can I find this this prefix, this hash prefix well, fastest? Yeah. That's a huge You're right. It is, yeah. You're right. And there could be um, there could be uh, specifics of the Bitcoin protocol that kind of make this different, you know. It may not be like, you know, you're right, it's like an order of magnitude or different in difficulty, and I'm sure they reconcile with someone such that it's not infeasible at every 2016 blocks. Okay, so smart contracts fit into this. Uh, so like, what if transfers weren't the only transactions? Uh, or sorry, what if let's say, you know, party, like software acting on behalf of users could issue transactions. So instead of just a node, me having that full access to my node issue a transaction, what if I could write a little program that kind of like exists on the blockchain and I could call into that program. And then that program can do modify the ledger state based on, you know, the code that it says, you know. So basically by calling into the smart contract, it's basically a program that exists on the blockchain uh, and, a, and a call is a transaction on the blockchain. Um, 
then you are giving permission based on uh, you know the key that you supply to this function call. Uh, it's, it can like issue transactions to the network or perform stateful modifications on the ledger on your behalf. Um, that's kind of a, a simple overview where you can let this kind of software entity act on behalf of you by, by calling into it. Um, and it doesn't have to just be transfer transactions. There's more complicated, right? For instance, the, the private distributed ledger we develop um, on a daily basis is, uh, you know, asset agnostic. So there's like any type of asset you can define. So smart contracts can be defined to operate on any type of asset and you can transfer holdings based on that. And you can even implement some, you know, st structured financial products using these, these contracts uh, that kind of manipulate the finances in a way specific to the way these financial instruments dictate. Um, so that's that. If there are no more questions, uh, that's the end. Uh, sorry, I kept you almost two hours. But that's that.